Hello and welcome to The Great Energy Transition, a new series from Intelligence Squared in partnership with Cummins. This series is all about bringing together leading voices to discuss the big questions around the environment and energy and the journey to net zero. I'm Helen Cheresky, I'm your host. And in our first two events, this is the uh, third one of three, we covered two big topics, what's happening between now and 2030 to achieve net zero and what needs to happen between 2030 and 2050 to achieve net zero. And in this third and final event, we'll be discussing the role of corporations in the energy transition. Now, there are plenty of big questions here. Do corporations lead or do they follow? Do they hold themselves to higher standards because they can? Or do they do the minimum required by the government to stay competitive? What about training the workforce, choosing goals and metrics, and stepping away from or towards products that could make a really big difference once they're out in the world? We will be dealing with all of that. Um, and obviously, corporations are important. You know, they've always been en engines of growth and innovation, but perhaps in the past, the fundamental aims were a little bit simpler. You know, uh, make money, grow, be around in 10 years' time. But this time it's different. Now we face a huge collective challenge, this energy transition, and society needs corporations to act as partners on a huge mission rather than winners and losers in these perhaps more traditional arguments about um, regulation and taxation. And increasingly, what corporations do is visible to the rest of us. Accountability is changing. And so it's not enough just to act, you have to be seen to act. So corporations have a huge role to play in this, and we will be discussing all of that. And here's how it's going to work. We'll get some perspective on our topic for today from each of our three expert speakers um, and their perceptions on how corporations are changing and what more is needed. And then we'll have a wider discussion with our panel. And after that, you get to ask your questions. Now, the way to do that um, is to find the Q&A button, which will be somewhere on the screen or device in front of you, um, to type in your question there if you'd like your name and where you're from to be read out do please include it with the question and importantly you can be asking those questions right the way through so you can start right now if you'd like and i'll be reminding you as we go along um, to be adding your questions in there so so as soon as a question occurs to you do please put it in the in the Q&A box. Uh, and if you are active on social media, do uh, tweet or LinkedIn or whatever social media you're using these days. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag IQ2 um, for Intelligence Squared. So do feel free to talk about what's going on with all um, on those on those uh, forums. Okay, so let's meet our speakers for today. We have three. First up, we have Jennifer Rumsey, who is the president and CEO of Cummings Inc. And she's currently overseeing the strategic direction, growth initiatives and global operations for this uh, company, which is 103 years old. So that's quite a responsibility. Uh, it's the world's largest independent manufacturer of engines and related technologies. And, and she's served in several leadership uh, positions across the company, so she knows it extremely well. Uh, next up, we have Gillian Tett, who is the chairman of the US editorial board and US editor at large at the Financial Times. She has written many books, including Fool's Gold and Anthro Vision, a new way to see business in and life. She holds a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge, and her work has been widely recognized by lots of organizations, uh, various prizes, including just as one example, uh, columnist, uh, business and journalist, journalist and business journalist of the year at the British Press Awards in, in 2014. And then finally, our third contributor is Jason Bordoff. Um, he's an American policy ex energy policy expert and researcher who works at the intersection of economics, energy and the environment, and also national security. He's the founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University and the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School. And he's previously served as special assistant to President Barack Obama and senior director for energy and climate change on the staff of the National Security Council. So as you can see, we have uh, some people who have a lot to say about this topic with a huge amount of experience to contribute. So let's get started started. Um, and, and Jen, let's start with you. Uh, just for those who don't know so much about Cummings or perhaps about your role, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'd love to. First, hello, everyone. Great to be with you. Thank you, Helen, for um, for leading this, this important discussion today. Uh, as you said, Cummins is a 103-year-old company who got our start in diesel engines and innovating diesel technology and really making it the standard power 
uh, provider for trucking. Um, and today we serve uh, customers around the world. We have more than 60,000 employees around the world um, in commercial and industrial applications. So our products go into applications that are at the heart of the con economy, critical to our daily lives, and also contribute meaning meaningfully um, to CO2 emissions and global CO2 emissions. So as, as CEO, my focus is on taking this 103-year-old company that started in diesel and really being a part of helping our uh, industry decarbonize um, and reach zero. And it's something that I look forward to the conversation about because I do think that companies play an important role in, in uh, leading and driving uh, at this very important time in our world. And and just very briefly, because obviously we'll be talking a lot about this, how, you know, the company has, your company has committed to reach net zero by 2050, which for a for a company that was entirely fossil fuel based is, is a big ask. So just briefly, how are you going to achieve, I mean, what does it, when a corporation is looking at that, yeah. like, how do you even go about that? Yeah, so, so Cummins has long embraced the stakeholder model and recognizing the importance of not only serving our customers, our investors, also our communities and our employees. And so we actually embrace challenge and use the, that challenge to drive innovation and growth. Uh, we've done that historically as we've reduced emissions from diesel engines, and we're really approaching the need to decarbonize uh, in a similar way. We we believe that for our industry that is so, both uh, economically vital and needs to be changed in a way that works for the economy and also uh, get to zero CO2 emissions that we do need to start investing and advancing technologies that get us all the way to zero. And we are doing that in our new power business with battery electric and fuel cell electric and green hydrogen technologies. And we also believe that diesel engines play an important role because we have to start today. We can't wait. Uh, our products get used for decades um, and so we must drive reductions in engine-based engine solutions uh, as, as well as develop these diverse solutions that will serve our applications and get all the way to zero. Great. Well, let's let's come to Gillian now. And Gillian, you've spent, you know, you've had a career writing about and discussing uh, the role that corporations play in climate change. So from your perspective, like, what do you think the state of play is now when it comes to corporations and sustainability goals? You know, is it really happening? And, and what, how much, you know, what should be happening next? Well, it's worth stepping back for a moment and saying that I first crashed into this world um, shortly after the election of Donald Trump when most journalists thought that the only thing that really mattered that was real news in America, where I'm based, was um, Trump, 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 and Trump. And I noticed I kept getting a lot of emails in my inbox from companies and their PRs talking about this thing called ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, and Sustainability. Um, and I deleted most of them for the first few months because you know most journalists are trained to think that when companies start talking about doing good and sustainability, they're basically doing a whole bunch of, you know, corporate spin or PR spin and trying to bamboozle journalists. Um, and then after a few months, I realized, I started, I started listening to the companies concerned and the financiers and realized that actually there was a shift in mentality going on, a zeitgeist shift, which was really about companies trying to redefine themselves to ha have a sense of purpose. Um, financiers trying to explain what impact on the world the chase for profits was actually having, um, and also governments running out of money to do their development ob ob objectives and needing to either use philanthropic cash or corporate cash to get things done. Um, and that was coming together to drive this whole ESG movement, the drive for sustainability. And most critically, it was driven by three things, there were three buckets of motives. Um, a tiny minority of companies were doing it because they genuinely wanted to change the world or investors. Um, those were people who were doing impact investing. They tended to, tended to be sort of Scandinavian pension funds and wealthy trust fund kids with a conscience and stuff. Um, and then you had a bigger pool of investors who wanted to do no harm to the world. And that was really what I call the sustainability crew. And then you had an even bigger group of companies. And this is a key point that really starting in about 2017, 2018, wanted to avoid doing harm to themselves because they'd realized that if they were essentially seen to be polluting the world, they were in danger of losing um, customers, employees, investors, having regulatory fines and reputational damage. 
So the whole drive towards environmental issues and sustainability had flipped from being something that was just kind of in the doing good bucket in one tiny department of the company, but had become a key component of risk management. Um, and that really changed the whole debate. I guess that's really it's really interesting from the point of view. I mean, it's perhaps um, encouraging from the point of view of listeners who might kind of feel helpless. You know, they're just people out in the world that actually public pressure does have an effect on those things. So perhaps that's a note of optimism there. And um, let's just so we've we've gone around everyone to get a, a, a rounded picture of, of who we've got here. Let's come to Jason uh, Bordoff. Now, so Jason, your your thing is energy policy and, and critically policy is is not you know, it, it, the politics is built into it, right? Um, so how, what's the interaction between governments and corporations like in this space? Like, is it, are they working together at the moment and how do we measure success? Well, I think ultimately we measure success by whether emissions start going down. And so by that metric, we're failing. We should remember other than a recession or a pandemic, emissions are going up each and every year. There are some promising indicators that tell us that might change going forward. The most recent annual outlook that the International Energy Agency produces, the one that just came out a few weeks ago, this is the first time ever in their outlook that they find that fossil fuel use peaks in the outlook. But bear in mind, the current outlook is to peak and plateau, not fall at the rate that would be necessary to come anywhere close to climate goals like net zero by 2050. And to get there, we're going to need both government uh, and, and, of course, the private sector. I run something, as you said, the Center on Global Energy Policy with the word policy in its name and have spent my career working in policy because I think it's necessary, not sufficient, but but necessary uh, to get to those goals. And it shapes the playing field uh, on in which companies, um, financial institutions, corporations make their decisions. The energy transition needs a whole of society buy-in. It's not going to work if government and corporations have an adversarial relationship and and both have a role to play. Uh, we need somewhere in the order of three to four trillion dollars a year of investment going into clean energy between now and 2050 to take a goal like net zero seriously. Most of that will be private capital. There's just not enough public capital uh, to fund the transition. Private capital can point it in a certain direction. It can de-risk certain new technologies or regions of the world. It can catalyze private capital. The same with the technologies that we're going to need somewhere around half of the cumulative emission reductions between now and 2050 in those net zero scenarios come from technologies that are not yet available at commercial scale. We need to bring the cost of those technologies down in government investment in early stage technologies in R&D, uh, research and development can help do that so the private sector can then step in and, and, and take it from there. And so I'm interested in something that, you know, the, what the big recent news in this area has been the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the IRA, which still feels strange for a British person to say. But um, so this has been the big policy move in the past few months. Um, is this going to do the job from your point of view, Jason? And we'll come to um, Gillian and Jen. But so, is you know, is this enough and is it going to work? Well, it's certainly not enough, but it is a very significant step forward, and it is the by far the largest investment in clean energy in, in U.S. history. Um, there's a range of projections out there, and you should take them all with a rather large grain of salt, but the U.S. commitment is to reduce emissions around 50 percent by 2030, and a range of modeling estimates show this will get us around 40 percent, so there's more work to do, but, but it makes a, a big step in, in the right direction. There are a lot of challenges to implementation, and I think that needs to be the focus now for, for all countries, not just the US. That is one thing that I don't think emerged as strongly as it could have or should have from the UN climate talks in Egypt is now taking the pledges and targets and the ambition that came out of recent climate talks, whether it's in Paris or Glasgow, and, and implementation. Let's actually make sure that we're doing what we said we would do. And in the US, that's going to be difficult. I mean, you look at some of the assumptions built into the modeling, those numbers I just gave, 40%, 50%, it assumes the Inflation Reduction Act spending, again, nearly $400 billion in spending, is able to increase renewables at a rate that would more than double the renewable capacity in the US by 2030. That requires a lot more transmission. Uh, it's really hard to build things. It's hard to get permitting. It's hard to get approvals. We're going to need to reform our processes here the way Europe is trying to do with Repower EU, not just because of climate, but also now an energy security challenge. 
Uh, we've seen a European backlash to the Inflation Reduction Act because there are elements of protectionism in it. There are elements of industrial policy, which says if you want the tax credits, you have to make sure certain activity is done in the US or sometimes free trade agreement countries. So I can go on the list. There's a range of implementation challenges, but the focus now really has to be putting that money to work and making sure that between now and 2030, we can scale clean energy at a rapid rate because it has come down in cost a lot. Solar batteries, they're all much, much cheaper. Now let's get them out there. Well, um, so let's, uh, Jen, I'm interested in your perspective on this, on these big policy things from government and how they how they incentivize corporations or how they have impacted, you know, Cummins. What What's it like if you're on the receiving end of all of this? Yeah, well, first I'll say I agree with Jason that the, the climate provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act are an important step and insufficient by themselves. Um, and uh, we do need policy. Policy plays an important role to complement what corporations are, are doing to actually drive the level of change that's required. And really, I th think about it in three dimensions. There's a massive need to build out an infrastructure to support alternate technologies that can reach zero emissions. You have to decarbonize that infrastructure and cost, right? All three of those are challenges we face today. And there's massive investment to build out that infrastructure and ensure that it's actually decarbonized. If we have charging infrastructure that is not fed from renewable energy, it's not any better for the environment than continuing to, to burn uh, fossil fuels and, and engines. So it must decarbonize and the costs are higher. Uh, you know, our customers today, many of them have set sustainability targets for themselves and they're seeking the most cost-effective way to achieve those because they're running businesses. Uh, uh, and these technologies cost more today. So important provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act, including providing some tax credits and incentives that help offset some of the higher costs in the early days, because as you scale this up and, and we move to higher volume production, costs will continue to come down. Um, and, and our view is that we can reach um, parity with uh, the cost of internal combustion engines over time, but those investments to, to again, drive scaling and also continue to advance the technology are critical, as well as the infrastructure side. And Gillian, how does that kind of policy play into, how does it compare with, you know, you were talking about the other incentives for uh, companies to shift their behavior. Do, do, the, do the big policy things, is that a big, you know, if a company was kind of heading in that direction anyway, is it more of a nudge in the right direction or is it the, is it the kick that makes them start rolling down the slope? Well, I was in the camp that was originally a bit cynical about the Inflation Reduction Act, primarily because it's one of the worst named bills out there. I mean, the branding is dreadful um, because it really hasn't got much to do with inflation at all. And it's not necessarily going to re reduce inflation. But what it does have underneath that totally misleading mislabel um, is actually a lot of very, very striking measures that most of us um, who are cynical journalists didn't actually think the Biden administration was actually going to get done. I mean, most of us didn't think the government was going to get anything done, but they did get this done. Um, and the important point to stress with this is that you know, in spite of all the signs of companies potentially black um, backsliding, greenwashing, in spite of the fact that the um, climate talks in Egypt were in many ways quite disappointing, what you have right now is this explosion of energy and activity in the private sector around renewables. Um, you've got a lot of deal making. You've got a huge number of investment funds with enormous amounts of money being raised to invest in renewables. And you have things like these incentives. Um, for companies to get going and actually try and install them and get the capacity together. Um, and, you know, incentives work. They really do work. Um, and some of the cost reductions we've seen in other technologies have been remarkable. And you have to hope that it's going to occur in other areas of the transition as well. I mean, the question I always have in my mind is whether we've seen the low hanging fruit already. I mean, the fact that it's now, you know, often cheaper to charge your you know, electric vehicle or Tesla than to fill it up with petrol or gas, you know, was that the low hanging fruit? The fact that, you know, solar and wind under some measures is now cheaper than other forms of fossil fuels, you know, was that the low hanging fruit? And I'd love to hear Jason say, talk about this. You know, how are you going to get the battery storage? How are you going to get all the heavy, boring, geeky stuff to do with infrastructure in place? Um, I suspect that could be the really tough stuff going forward. But um, certainly, you know, the I, the Inflation Reduction Act is remarkable. Well, it is. I mean, the, the, the problem with all of this is that firstly, in the way the devil is in the detail. And secondly, as you say, the 
public perception of that detail is often that it's just not very sexy at all. Um, when, you know, new wind turbines might be great, but retrofitting homes isn't. Um, Jason, I'm interested in your, you know, as someone who has worked within, you know, as a policy advisor to an administration, you've seen the kind of the sticky end of this, right? The negotiations, the are they actually going to do what we want them to do? You know, if a government is trying to incentivize companies to do something, what's your experience of just could you just share some of that experience and how, whether it's frustrating to be on the inside or whether you feel like you can actually get things done? Well, it's certainly frustrating much of the time, and I suspect that's only more true today, given how polarized our politics is and how hard it is to get things done. But when you can get something done, um, there are a few things that can move the needle as much as major federal policy initiative, uh, certainly in a large country like the U.S. And I think the Inflation Reduction Act is a good example of that. I think we had some big wins in the Obama administration, like the uh, Recovery Act that was $90 billion of investment in green energy. This is several, several times that. But it is, uh, as I said earlier, now, now the challenge is implementation and how do we make sure that we uh, put this bill to work in a way that really drives decarbonization. And as we heard already, some discussion of solar and wind or electric vehicles and how much the cost of those things have come down. By the way, the costs are going up the last couple of years. So there is this question now about inflation in the clean energy sector driven by supply chain problems, the dramatic increase in uh, critical minerals, the lithium, the things you need to make the batteries. So the components that will be needed for a clean energy transition, those have economic and geopolitical challenges we should come back to. Uh, but of course, renewables create electricity, and electricity is only around 20% of the world's final energy consumption. And when you look at the rest of parts of the energy system hopefully can be electrified like maybe heating homes or driving cars that's harder to do for other parts of transportation like shipping or aviation it's harder to do for major parts of industry like glass making and fertilizer and steel and cement so we're going to need a pretty broad range of technologies renewables will play a really important role but we're not going to decarbonize globally with renewables alone and many of those technologies have to have to advance further and there again there's a really important role for government and then there's a really important role for companies and, and many are making um, early commitments. Uh, we saw this with this, this initiative called the First Movers Coalition that, that came together again in, uh, in Egypt at the COP this year. A group of companies that have said we're willing to pay somewhat of a premium uh, to try to make sure that we're making commitments for how to do some things in lower carbon ways that admittedly are costlier today, but hopefully if we can get them to scale, will come down in cost and be more affordable the way we've seen solar costs fall 90%, uh, wind, wind costs fall around 70%, battery costs fall almost 90% over the last 10, 15 years. So well, let's pick up on the, the corporations having goals, uh, specific goals on this. Um, so, uh, Julian, you mentioned the acronym ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance. Um, and, you know, so, so it sounds great. So a corporation comes along, they're like, you know, I want to be a good person. I want to be seen as a good actor. Here are my ESG goals. But this is a messy thing, right? You know, in a way, part of the problem is that money is easy to count and success in these environmental and social things isn't easy to count. So how how do we make sure that corporations, so we'll, we'll come in a minute to Jen and, and what Cummins are doing about this, but how, how are corporations, how do we check? Like, where's the accountability here? Well, the important thing to understand is basically the, what's going on here once you get beyond ESG and the details of the green transition is a really fundamental zeitgeist shift in companies because in the middle of the 20th century, an economist called Milton Friedman came out and said, the company should only care about shareholders. And that dominated the whole way that company executives were trained and that investors thought about companies for many, many years. And what's, what people have not failed to realize was that Milton Friedman was in many ways a product of his time. And he lived in an era post-World War II when two or three things were true, which are not true today. Firstly, post-World War II, there was very little transparency about what companies were doing except for quarterly reports um, or half yearly reports. Most people didn't know. Um, secondly, people tended to assume that it was the job of government, not companies, to fix big social problems because they kind of trusted government to get stuff done post-World War II. Um, and thirdly, people had a lot of respect for leaders and authority figures. And today what's happened is that people don't trust government to do anything. All the surveys show that businesses are as trusted as government to actually get stuff done. Um, and there's radical transparency in the sense that anyone using a smartphone can see what is happening inside companies a lot of the time through Glassdoor 
or increasingly through satellites tracking which companies are emitting what, um, there's a real sense of transparency. And why the society doesn't really trust authority figures anymore, there's much more sense of trust in the group. So you add that together and the, what companies are doing in response is going from this very narrow tunnel vision, I'm only going to think about shareholders and money and profits, into thinking about what I call lateral vision, stakeholders, wider society. It's a really fundamental zeitgeist shift because if they ignore what society thinks these days, um, it's going to come back and bite them. That's increasingly the issue around risk management because society can see and society can, can complain courtesy of our smartphones. So that's one of the key things why companies are behaving like this, because if you want to protect shareholders today, like Milton Friedman said you should, you have to look at stakeholders anyway. It's no longer a big divide. And people are using that radical transparency to keep watching companies and to scream out and yell at them and to yell at journalists when they are falling short. You know, my inbox is, I created something called Moral Money at the FT, which is our platform that tracks um, ESG and sustainability. It's a newsletter. And I get, you know, shed loads of emails every single week from NGOs tracking what companies are doing and screaming if they fall short. Is um, it's made it very complicated, but as you say, it's it's a collective effort. That's it's quite interesting. It's become a collective effort. That, that accountability has become that. Okay, then. So, so Jen, from your point of view, um, you know, do you how how are you going to check that you you've got you know you've got these ambitious ESG goals? How are you going to be accountable to yourselves? And and do you feel this pressure from the outside that Julian was describing? Yeah, certainly the focus on ESG from investors, from our employees has has grown. What I would say is it's built into the DNA and culture of Cummins. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Cummins embraced the idea of a stakeholder model before it was the, the, the thing that companies thought about. And we've embraced the need to ensure that everything we do leads to a cleaner, healthier, safer environment for decades uh, it started in the 90s with the need, need to reduce criteria pollutant from diesel engines. And, and, you know, I've personally been involved in my entire career at Cummins advocating for policy and regulation that that really drives innovation and reducing the environmental impact of, of our products. It's the thing that brought me to Cummins in 2000 after starting my career working on fuel cells, by the way. Um, and so... Uh, we have set goals, right? And we've worked uh, both internally and with the government to ensure that we're creating regulation and policy that advances those. We set in 2006, our first facility uh, energy and greenhouse gas goal uh, and, and, and drove towards that and joined um, at the time the US EPA Climate Leadership Program our current environmental sustainability plan, which we call Planet 2050, we published in 2019. That was our second broad environmental sustainability plan, by the way. Um, and how we measure ourselves is we set specific goals. We have qualitative goals for 2030 uh, that are both focused on our product, which is by far our biggest impact uh, on the environment is through our products and scope three emissions, and also on our facilities and our communities. Um, and so we've got those, those qualitative goals for 2030, and then we have quantitative targets for 2050 that are aligned to the Paris Climate Accord, and we'll publish how we're doing uh, against those. And we want to ensure that those ESG me measures drive real impact in a meaningful way, and that you're not just feeding the monkey and, and you know reporting things that aren't actually uh, truly impacting the environment. Great. Well, I'd just like to remind the audience, we're not quite at questions yet, but as you're thinking of questions, as you're going along, do uh, use the Q&A tab somewhere on your, your device or your browser, put your question in there, put your name in and where you're from, um, and you can be adding those now as we're, as we're going along, and we will get to the questions in just a few minutes. Um, but I'd like to come now to a, a sort of different aspect of uh, the sort of ESG landscape which i think isn't is sort of talked about but it's often not talked about in the same in the same way as the rest of it and that's the people side of it right you know and, and the role of co that corporations have in making sure first of all that people that individuals are kind of helped through this transition um especially their workforce but also you need a new skill set right there's a whole load of things that you know um Jason was mentioning things like wind turbines and solar. Well, we don't have enough wind turbine and solar engineers. We need to get them from somewhere. We need someone needs to train them. And so I'm interested in, in the perspective from all three of you actually about um, 
that the responsibility of of the people side of this which definitely isn't to do with shareholders i guess perhaps except in the very long term but what about who does the training who takes responsibility for the community who takes responsibility for helping people should that be corporations or should it be somebody else uh, jason let's come to you first yeah maybe i'll answer that just by making a broader observation about sort of the conversation in the last few minutes and i think it relates to people because and i'm wondering if jen and jillian disagree it does i think it's important to note uh that this whole conversation and the role of corporations in esg i wonder if they think it has a particularly Western sort of US European take to it. And when we look at the challenge of climate change, of course, it doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 emissions come from, they all contribute equally to the problem. The bulk of the growth in emissions going forward is from emerging and developing economies. Again, I gave that number of three to $4 trillion a year of investment in clean energy, most private, most in the emerging and developing economies. That's where the growth in energy use is. And in those parts of the world, I think the concerns are often uh, different and the motivations of companies are different because much of the world's energy system is dominated by state-owned enterprises. And so we often talk in the oil and gas sector, for example, about the companies we've all heard of, BP and Exxon and Shell, et cetera. Those so-called super majors make up 15% of the world's oil and gas. Uh, most of the world's oil and gas comes from national oil companies and state-owned enterprises that have different sets of incentives <clears throat> um, and uh, and different excuse me different challenges when one thinks about how to move in a, a lower carbon direction we around the world we're talking about renewables we are still building new coal plants even if we stopped building new coal plants if we operate the existing set of coal plants to the end of their normal economic life so they pay back investors that alone would cause us to exceed our carbon budget by 2050 and that's just a function of how big the numbers are what it takes to meet energy needs and energy growth for people uh, around around the world so when you talk about the people involved part of that is people who have almost nothing and have contributed almost no emissions uh, to date and and who are looking to consume much larger amounts of energy for because of the prosperity and the economic growth that goes along with that as you said then when we make that transition and hopefully produce our energy in different ways uh, uh, in, with clean forms of clean energy instead of, of fuels like coal. Um, that is economically disruptive to very significant parts of some communities uh, and, and some countries. And so it is important to make sure that we do a much better job than we have to date, taking seriously what the economic dislocations look like. And I think there's often whether it's free trade for the last 30 years or now talking about the energy transition promises made that you know winners can compensate losers and don't worry we can have new retraining programs and, and someone who's worked in the coal mine can figure out how to do something else that's that's not we don't have a great track record of success with that and i think that we do need much greater government policy focus to put real funding into that and real programs and then of course the corporate sector uh, and companies are going to have a huge role to play building the workforce that they will need Jen knows better than I do what Cummins needs to make sure that they can build in a different way moving forward. Well, then we have the challenge to the two of you there. So, you, so, so Gillian and Jen, you can pick up on, on either side of that, either the more general uh, workforce and people thing or this international, the fact that, you know, different countries are, are arriving in this space at, from different places um, and they have different needs. Um, Gillian, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, a point of good news and cheer is that if you slap the word green on almost any student university course today, um, you will get your attendance quadruple immediately. I mean, audit classes have often been fairly sparsely attended at business schools because it's like, oh, gosh, go, go do audit. If you slap in the <coughs> words, if you put green audit on a business school class, suddenly everyone enrolls. So the good news is that lots of young people today do want to train to go into the green fields. Um, the bad news is that the pipeline is slow um, and it's going to take a while for that to happen. And there needs to be a lot of retraining of people in middle careers, particularly people who are working in fossil fuels and need to be redeployed. So that will require some smart government intervention and public-private partnership, and they need to get a move on. Um, the bad news has come to a very, very different point about the developing world, the emerging markets, and their need for capital. Jason's 100% right, of course, that um, in many ways that is the key arena where the debate about how to decarbonize going forward it's critical because they are carbonizing right now by building coal plants and other emission heavy forms of energy um, infrastructure. Um, the one of the most shameful things that did not happen at in Egypt, or rather it should have happened, it didn't, and that's shameful, 
was the failure of the rich Western world to find more effective ways to channel money to support the energy transition in the developing world. Um, it doesn't just mean in terms of giving direct aid and loan, uh, direct aid and loans, although that should be happening much more. The really, really critical component is how are you going to move all the money in the private sector trapped in the West to the emerging markets? And that's very unlikely to happen unless um, something called blended finance starts happening, which is basically using government money to provide an insurance policy for private sector investors who want to invest in risky projects. And in most emerging market green projects are risky. This requires coordination from groups like the World Bank, and they need to get move on very, very urgently, because unless that happens, the money is not going to flow. And if the money doesn't flow, coal plant plants will keep being built and we'll all fry. Um, you just reminded me of something extraordinary. I was I met someone at the weekend who now works in the renewables industry in, in Norway, and they said they graduated 10 years ago. And they told me that when they graduated, the renewables companies were only employing people with oil and gas experience because they were already trained in something to do with offshore energy. And so he went to work in the oil and gas uh, sector for eight years to get enough experience to go into the renewables industry and i thought that was the most ridiculous thing i had ever heard i'm hoping it's better now and um, jen on the people then what, what's your perspective on all of this yeah great well first i just i want to say uh you know cummins is a global company and as i've talked about our environmental sustainability goals those do encompass our our global business and we work hard on on regulation and policy as well as partnerships uh, in our key markets uh, around the world. In fact, just last week, we signed a memor memorandum of understanding with one of our key partners in India, Tata, uh, to collaborate on zero emissions technology, including hydrogen engines, battery electric and fuel cell vehicles. But people is a topic that um, I think is critically important. So I'm really glad that you raised it, Helen. And you know, the first uh, aspect that to me is so important is how do we actually create an environment where we're bringing diverse perspectives and everybody is in and helping to solve the challenges that we're facing in this world. And so there's a lot of focus in Cummins on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really creating an environment where we've got big challenges. And, you know, as a woman who came up through a technical field, right? Uh, women are in the minority in engineering, and we need to address that. We need to ensure that we're not excluding parts of our population from um, bringing their, their ideas and perspective to bear on these problems. So that's the first challenge is bring everybody in. We can't leave people on the sidelines as we're, we're tackling climate change. And then the second is that as the technology evolves, there is a need to, to reskill and advance um, skills in certain areas. I see it as um, partially a evolving skills that people have. So as a mechanical engineer, I came into Cummins and worked on electronic engines that had after treatment chemical systems, right? Our skills evolve over time. And a lot of what we need to do will be evolving the skills that our employees have over time. And there are areas where we need to really focus on advancing capability uh, in the electronic space and the battery space, uh, semiconductors. And so we do need to have a focused effort, both at a, a collegiate level, as well as professional and uh, advancing skills in, in critical areas. And, and that's something that we are focused on doing. Well, uh, talking of people, let's hear from the people. So uh, people out in the audience, this is your chance to ask your questions. There is a Q&A tab somewhere. Do put your name and uh, where you're from, if you'd like. Uh, it's not required. You can, you can uh, ask your question anonymously. So do that now. We are at audience questions. And so let's start with um, a question which I think a lot of people a lot of people feel and they express it in different ways, which is from uh, Rosario de Dio. And the question is, um, the economics of energy transition are complex, but not complicated. Why do you think the debate is still very polarized and not evidence driven? So I guess the first part there is, is the debate still polarized and, and to what degree? And then why is it that the doing bit and the debate seems to lag behind uh, what the logic perhaps says we should do. Um, Jason, you can start on this. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the answer to it's probably different in different places. And I think the the broad issue, you know, th th there there is a history in 
in the US, we should remember it was um, in the George H.W. Bush administration that a cap and trade system for sulfur dioxide was put in place for local air pollution that caused acid rain or the fundamental landmark laws we have, like the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency were created during the administration of Nixon. Uh, conservation has had a bipartisan consensus uh, and the issue of climate change and the energy transition has become increasingly polarized. I think some politicians are responsible for using it as a political wedge. I think some companies are responsible for muddying the waters and trying to cast doubt on what is pretty clear science of of climate change caused by by the human use, largely, not entirely, uh, human use of, uh, of, of fossil fuels and also the agriculture uh, sector. And, um, and I think people, there are costs. I mean, in many ways, you may see improvements where things become more economic over time, but on the whole, there are, it's probably more expensive to make cement and steel in low carbon ways than not low carbon ways. Maybe that'll be different in the future. It's sometimes harder to see the benefits. How do you, the government, US, government just came out with a revised estimate of what the cost to society is from the damages of putting a ton of CO2 into the atmosphere, so-called social cost of carbon. It, it can be harder to see the consequence of inaction and what the actual cost uh, will be to society of the impacts of climate change. But I think that's changing too. I think people see each and every day in their lives, whether it's flooding in Pakistan or you know um, wildfires across California, more severe heat waves, things are changing, things are different, and that's going to unfortunately get worse, uh, not better. And so I think hopefully there is a growing sense that climate change is, is a problem. And you do see that in, in polling and you look, um, Certainly uh, on both sides of the aisle, it's more for Democrats than Republicans, but both are shifting. Uh, and it's also truer for young people than older people. When you ask them, what is their top concern? Uh, increasingly, climate change is rising to the top of that list or, or near the top, the top few issues. Um, Gillian or Jen, do you have a, a, a contribution on that, on the, the, the debate and the why, it, why it seems to be so hard to convince, to get everyone on board with doing this? Um, Gillian, perhaps. Um, well, you know, one simple answer is turkeys don't vote for Christmas. And um, th there's an entire fossil fuel industry out there that's trying to present, preserve um, its business and to fend off anything that's going to stop their business flourishing. Um, and they've been lobbying a lot. And there's a lot of politicians who are beholden to the fossil fuel industry in the past. So that's a big issue. Um, but secondly, as Jason points out, you know, there have been moments in the past when in fact, there was more of a bipartisan consensus around the need to act on this. If you look back to 1960s and the era of Rachel Carson and the Silent, Silent Spring movements, um, two things were remarkable about, about that. One was that in that era, which, as I said earlier, was the mid 20th century, when people looked to government, not business, to solve problems. In that era, the Rachel Carson activists didn't even bother trying to talk to corporate leaders. Their entire focus on lobbying was government and unions, um, not company owners and um, investors and CEOs. Very striking shift has taken place in terms of the people we expect to fix problems in the last 50 years. Um, secondly, in those days, it really was bipartisan because it was seen as protection and preservation, which is something which is quite a con naturally conservative value. In particular, they were trying to protect and preserve the national parks. Um, and there's quite a lot of polling that suggests that if you could change some of the language around the climate change discussions now and talk about stewardship and environmental protection, um, you'd probably bring a lot more of the right wing on board. And you could even tap into the evangelical vote as well by talking about stewardship, because that's a very strong concept within the Christian tradition. And so there could be ways to try and put, you know, bring that. But unfortunately, in the climate right now, it's so polarized that simply the fact that there are so many progressives arguing for climate change measures means that you're guaranteed to get a number of the far right saying no just on that basis um jen do you have a do you have a, a do you, what do you see in terms of the the debate and whether people are convinced or not or convinced to move quickly i guess i think broadly people recognize climate change is a real issue um at, you know as as jason pointed out you only need to read the paper each morning to see further evidence of the the impact that's having on the planet and on, and on people around the world. And, and that is also why with this polarization in our political system, you see growing pressure on corporations to act, um, to do something uh, from, from the, the public. And as we've talked about over the last 45 minutes, policy plays an important role. And so we really do need to um, 
in a bipartisan way tackle some of these issues in, in the government as well. The other thing I would say is, well, on the one hand, I can recognize climate change as a real issue and believe that we need to do something when it comes to my bottom line and do I want to pay more to buy a car or to, to you know, to, to fuel fuel that vehicle. If it's costing me more, then that's a challenge, right? And so, and with inflation and other pressures, um, that that reality is is very much there. You know, personally, um, my view is putting a price on carbon and driving the most economic way to to address the issue um, makes a lot of sense. And you have to you have to have a way to do that that is equitable. Um, which is why it, you know, is is challenged politically. But I do think that at, at some point we need to have uh, increasing focus on carbon tax, pricing on carbon, some way to monetize the impact of CO two. Well, we've got a nice question that follows on from that from uh, David Corgard, and and in a way, this is kind of the other kind of frustration. So um, he asks, how can companies? basically is asking how how can companies explain to the public that you can't switch overnight you know this is a huge transition and it takes time to work out what works at scale and how to do it and how to organize it and i guess you know from the public's point of view so here in the uk with the way our electricity supplies work we can just switch in principle to another to a renewable electricity company and we can just you know press a button online and suddenly we can pay for renewable electricity um and so for the for a consumer, it sort of looks like, oh, well, I should just be able to choose something different. So how, and yet, you know, the companies behind the scenes go, oh, but you can only have renewable energy if someone's got some permits and built some wind turbines and done all this other stuff. How, how do we sort of keep the public enthusiastic about this change while saying, we're not going to get there, you know, we, it's going to take some time, or should we just push the corporations harder? Jason, what do you think? Well, I think if uh, if if corporate leaders want to help improve public understanding, the first thing they should do is point them to the work of the Center on Global Energy Policy at, at Columbia. Um, <laughs> Everyone and, can get their plug in; it's great, it's fine. <laughs> and, and I'm being I'm being uh, a little a little facetious, but but obviously you know that is our mission. But obviously, many other actors in that ecosystem to help people understand the scale and difficulty of this challenge. You know, uh, we've heard from. Jen, about the really extraordinary work Cummins is doing all around the world. She mentioned partnerships with Tata, for example. It's a good example, right? India, <clears throat> which has about 150 gigawatts of solar energy, has a staggeringly ambitious goal to get to 500 by 2030. Very hard to achieve. If they can achieve it, coal use in India will be higher in 2030 than it is today. Because that's how big the math of our energy system is. That's how big the numbers are. And if you think about the Inflation Reduction Act we talked about before, and the assumptions that go into how much that will reduce emissions. It assumes that these large tax credits, bear in mind you only get the tax credit if the battery in your car has components that are have nothing to do with China in terms of their mining, refining, processing, that supply chain barely exists today. And then if we are able to deploy those tax credits, EV sales increase sevenfold, seven times between now and 2030. And then, of course, you need the charging infrastructure and the grid to support that. <clears throat> and the average vehicle is on the road 12, 13, 14 years. So it takes time for the energy system to turn over. It takes time for the capital stock to turn over. And that's a big problem we have with climate change because we are um, unfortunately running out of time in terms of the number of years that are left to start to bring down emissions consistent with a goal like net zero 2050. So, you know, two things can both be true at the same time. One is significant corporate leadership and commitment moving in clean energy. One is a dramatic growth in clean energy year on year and emissions keep going up. And that's been the history of the last 10, 15 you know, years. And so I think just helping people understand the scale and magnitude of this challenge, you talked about what an individual consumer in Europe can, can do. But of course, as a system, Europe is coping with the cutoff of Russian gas often by in the near term moving to coal, building new LNG import infrastructure, because it's going to take many years to build out a renewable electricity system in Europe, not to mention all again all the parts of the economy that that electricity can't fuel yet. So we need to move much faster to do those things and and help, you know, improve public awareness as much as we can and bring consumers along. And, and Jen, I imagine you're on the very much on the sharp end of this because you know, for all that Cummins talks about these new technologies, you are still making diesel engines. So how how do you deal with the sort of education thing for the public here? Yeah, I spend a lot a lot of time on this. It's you know, it is why um, 
my view is that diesel does play a role in decarbonization because we can't wait, right? We can't wait and we have to accelerate zero-based technologies and put them in markets where the infrastructure can exist, uh, where the technology is viable. But if you think about a long haul truck that's going across the country, there is no charging infrastructure first. And second of all, a range of a, a heavy duty truck with a battery is 100 to 200 miles. And these trucks regularly operate three to 400 miles you know, in a, in a day. And so the bottom line is if we did stop selling diesel engines and only sold battery electric and fuel cell electric, which we could, we have those technologies, customers couldn't use them to run their business. They couldn't buy them. They wouldn't work. And so we have to build this out in a stepwise way. And we have to, you know, really invest in uh, the infrastructure and advancing the technology so that we can get there. Um, and then we have to think about how do we more efficiently use what we have, uh, because that can be a part of um, solving this issue, too, is really that efficiency of how we're moving people and goods. Um, well, and, and I mean, the, the CO2 emissions from that. Well, the thing we the thing we don't that people don't talk about is using less energy is the most efficient thing of all, and and that's that's another story. And um, Gillian, do you see do you see this sort of tussle between the you know just do it now and the the speed at which companies are moving, or is that is that is it just do you think it's happening at the speed it's happening and everyone will just deal with it? Well, I have a lot of sympathy for companies right now because um, it's certainly the case that there are companies which are acting in bad faith. And there are companies that are basically doing greenwashing and it is for some companies it is more corporate um, spin than actual reality however having said all that there are many many companies that actually are really fighting to promote the energy transition um you know as much for reasons of self-defense as anything else um but many of them are now caught between a complete rock and a hard place because on the one hand if you're a company operating in america um, you have a whole bunch of Republicans and a whole bunch of red states that are actually attacking you for introducing green measures. Um, you know, it sounds unbelievable for people sitting in Europe, but that is the reality. Um, and at the same time, in parts, other parts of America, the blue states, the Democrat states, you've got people attacking you if you're not moving fast enough. Um, people, everyone knows that America's you know, divided in the states in terms of the abortion issues and Roe v. Wade. But it's just as divided if you look at what's happening in terms of green policies. So a company operating in America today is kind of in a no-win situation. Um, and just to add to the problem is if they stand up and talk about what they're trying to do to be green. Um, you know, two or three years ago, when I first created Moral Money at the FT, I had CEOs queuing around the block to try and get interviewed to tell me how brilliant they were and tell me about their net zero pledges and how much they love net zero. Um, and we couldn't get enough of it. Now you have this extraordinary thing happening called green hushing, not green washing, but green hushing, in that CEOs don't want to stick their heads above the parapet because they'll be attacked from the right for doing too much and they'll be attacked from by activists for doing too little. Um, and the latter is a real issue because if you stand up and say, I've got a net zero pledged, you then get a whole bunch of NGOs watching you and saying, oh, well, you haven't quite done what you said. Um, so it's really, really tough. And I totally understand that. For what it's worth, I think the media has to become more mature, recognize that, yes, there's greenwashing and backsliding, but also recognize it ain't going to happen tomorrow. And that many companies are on a journey and trying, but it's not easy. And they are caught between a rock and a hard place. And most importantly, I think companies and policymakers have to get a lot more honest that they are on a journey and they don't know what, what, what works and what doesn't. They're trying to rebuild the engine of a plane as they actually fly it. They have to be honest and say they're going to be mistakes. And above all else, everybody has to grow up and become more honest about trade-offs because there are going to be trade-offs, trade-offs, trade-offs. And if anyone pretends there's a magic wand that's going to solve all the problems without trade-offs, they are not just living in cow cooker land, they're lying to themselves and everyone else. And that means both society and companies and policymakers have to recognize there are trade-offs, embrace them, and realize we're all collectively on a journey. Well, um, let's not have Sorry. any green, let's not have any green hushing around here and put Jen on the spot then. <laughs> so um, as, the, as the sort of representative of the corporate world here, which you, I guess you are, what, what specific, you, you know, you did mention some before, but you've got, you've got this planet 2050 plan. So what, what specific, what are you going to put your neck on the line for, I guess, you know, do, do your, do your anti-green hushing thing here. Yeah, well, you know, I think you have, you know, 
we will stand up and fight for what we believe is right. And, you know, at the end of the day, it may not always be popular, but it's really focused on doing what's right for the planet, what's right for our employees, our customers, and our investors. And we do believe that there's an inter intersection of those things. Decarbonization and the need to reduce CO2 emissions uh, is a critical challenge. This planet will not continue to exist if we don't recognize that reality uh, and address uh, climate change. And we believe it's a growth opportunity for our business. So we lean into the challenge, the need to actually fundamentally change the company and what we look like. You know, we speak up and speak out on the key elements of policy, regulation, uh, supply chain, you know, all of those talent, all of those issues that are, are required to drive this change. I mean, we talk, we've been talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. I've, you know, I and other leaders have come and actively advocated for that. I was, um, you know, in um, an event with President Biden in the White House just before that was signed. So we're not afraid to speak out. And I think companies have to do that, right? We have to come to the table with data um, and be transparent about what's required because these are complicated issues, right? There's no magic button that solves them, but we got to bring that and lean into the, the challenge, figure out how we really leverage the, the, the workforce and the talent that we have because people are motivated by this too. When I talk about decarbonization and our strategy to our employees, they get energized. Um, and we need to tap into that and 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 solve the the problem and, and get past um, you know this view that it's going to be easy or we don't want to change because it's just critical critical for for the future sustainability of our planet. Okay, well that is a great. We are run out we've run out of time, but I think leaving the audience energized is a great place to finish. So um, I'd like to thank our three fabulous contributors, uh, Jennifer Rumsey, Gillian Tett, and Jason Bordoff, and of course thank you to the audience for listening and contributing your questions. Uh, thank you to Intelligence Squared and Cummings for organising this event. If you'd like to see more of what Intelligence Squared does, please visit intelligencesquared.com, uh, and we can also watch the previous two events in this series there. And for more inf for more information about Cummings, you can visit Cummings.com. And that's it for today. So lots of food for thought. I hope you get on and do some thinking. Let's all make this happen. Uh, so thank you very much and goodbye.